everyone and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, interactive webinar. Uh, really, this is meant to be thought provoking. It's meant to be sharing experiences and please raise as any as many questions uh, as you as you like. Um, in case I cannot answer the question straight away or we're running out of time, um, I'm always uh, available to answer you and so your questions will slide, uh, you know, after the session. Um, there will be my contact details at the end of the presentation, uh, and you're more than welcome to reach out to me uh, if you need more, uh, you know, more thoughts or, or, or more discussion on a specific subject. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for joining. I'm uh, just brief introduction about myself. Uh, been working for yeah a long time as, as Malavan uh, just stated. I've been I've been working for 30 years now. Uh, started in consultancy in mergers and acquisitions, process reengineering, um, and a number of consultancy uh, assignments. I was based in France. Then I moved to the United Kingdom, where I worked for a number of uh, tier one banks, so G Capital. Credit Suisse, uh, Barclays, the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, and uh, really, I, I, I moved from, at the beginning, I was, I was mainly in financial control, but then I quickly moved into risk management because I thought that was a really interesting area. And there were, you know, back 20 years ago, risk management was not developed as it is right now. And um, so I've been through this, uh, this journey on, on risk management. And then I moved to compliance uh, recently. I've been in the UAE, based in the UAE for the last seven years. And uh, throughout the last seven years, I've really strengthened my experience in operational risk. I was chief operational risk officer for Standard Chartered Bank for the region, which is Africa, Middle East, and Pakistan. And then I also I had um, you know, more global roles where I helped design and implement uh, global operational risk management uh, methodology, new methodology uh, across a uh, sun chartered bank uh, worldwide. So I was really working you know, in many different jurisdictions um, and trying to embed the new methodologies into all types of business products and geographies. I also recently I was um, I moved to compliance and especially financial crime compliance. I was part of this um, remediation program that Standard Chartered Bank had launched back in 2014. And in 2017, they decided to um, undertake a massive remediation program of three years, which cost a, a big, you know, above one billion US dollars on, on three years to fix all the um, weaknesses and, and, and gaps they had in managing compliance, uh, financial compliance risks, so AML sanctions and bribery and corruption. So I was really, I was, I was um, leading these four work, four work streams out of 14, one of which is assurance. So today's topic is also second part we will talk about is effective quality assurance. Um, lots of learning from my experience there. Um, also, I have a background of education. I speak to at conferences, not only uh, on a variety of subjects, but also for professionals to confirm their certification and qualifications. Uh, recently, CIMA, where I spoke about risk, ma risk management methodologies, and uh, also at Standard Chartered Bank, but also in, um, in my previous roles in, in the Royal Bank of Scotland or Barclays, uh, and in GE Capital, I was, um, I was holding a number of training sessions, so a lot of training and embedding and education internally. And I also developed the online training module for operational risk at Standard Chartered Bank, which was a, a worldwide and, and you know, meant to have, uh, meant to reach all staff uh, on an onboarding, uh, from an onboarding and then an annual refresher. So I've, I've really contributed a lot to operational risk, but you know, every year there is something new which is happening, which is why this topic is so, is so rich and so interesting. So as, as Malavan said, before we start, um, 
there will be the recording will be available i think malavan said on youtube ask your questions anytime uh, don't wait for the end and also after the session you can answer questions and uh, you will be uh, you will be offered the opportunity as well to suggest any themes you would want to see covered in the in the future session so this is the first one hopefully of, of a series of very interesting interactive discussions uh, but let's talk about operational risk and um, and having uh, you know sharing sharing good practices and and thought-provoking um, aspects about operational risks. I'm going to start with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put you at contribution straight away. Uh, and I've got a question for you. So presuming your bank, and, I, and, I, and I, I believe your bank has a second line of defense in place, how many of you feel it is effective? Uh, Malavan is going to launch a poll and you've got uh, about 10 seconds to, um, to answer the question. So is it very effective? Is it effective but it needs more improvement? Or is it ineffective? Okay. Malavan, I think we are, um, we're probably there or thereabout. I think you, zero of you believe it's very effective. Uh, no surprise there, uh, I have to say. Um, effective but needs more improvement. You 88% of you, seven people believe it's effective but needs more improvement. And then one um, think it's not very effective at all. So, you know, this is, these are interesting results. And we're going to try to explore, you know, what are the areas that uh, would grant some, some focus uh, to get to a level where they feel they're comfortable with the second line of defense and, and, how, and how this is operating within, within the bank. Interestingly, uh, you know, you, we are in the Middle East, so you could think, oh yeah, but that's, that's because of the Middle East, that's because of the GCC, we're less mature than other areas of the world. Well, maybe, but maybe not, actually. Um, unsurprisingly, or maybe surprisingly for some of you, a lot of the banks which are in more mature regions, like, say, the United States, Canada, and Europe, or Australia, New Zealand, I've actually got more or less the same results as what you've just uh, displayed here. Um, very, very few believe they've got an effective second line of defense. Uh, and many believe there, are, there is really room for improvements. So it's not specific to the region. And um, I think it's got maybe something to do as well with, uh, with a number of aspects about the second line. I'm going to ask you, um, uh, you know, I'm going to open up here for uh, getting your thoughts about why do you think, what do you think are the main drivers uh, or the main, sorry, the main areas where you would like to see some improvements for the second line? And I'm going to open up to the floor. You're going to need to unmute yourself. Who wants to get a start? Hi, this is uh, Nasir Islam speaking. Hello. Um, hello. Uh, I work for Faisal Bank Limited at Karachi in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, thoughts on this are that the second line of defense uh, does struggle in uh, collecting a lot of data or information on the operational risks that are happening in the first lines uh, or the business lines. Um, so, so what they really struggle is in collecting and analyzing that data. Uh, most of the times they complain that the data is not coming to them or the first line or the businesses, they do not send the data to them. So there's no mechanism of them for capturing 
uh, mm. the, the operational risk data and thus analyzing and uh, providing any mitigating uh, actions to control them. Understand. So it's a, it's a lack of MI and the visibility that the second line uh, has. Has anybody is anybody facing the same issues in their bank? Can I? Oh yes. Yeah, uh, we are facing the same issue. Uh, plus, uh, the second point and the very important point for us here in Qatar, I'm working in Qatar, uh, Al Khaliji Bank in Qatar. Um, uh, the 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 level of authority you are giving from the management, or since you are not independent. Uh, uh, department uh, uh, and sometimes they are leading your investigation sometimes um, uh, uh, you are here only for a regulatory perspective uh, uh, regulatory uh, requirements only so the, the, the level of authority you have uh, will not give you the power to, to, uh, to, to ask and collect all the information you want from the first line of defense, or even the third line of defense, if you want any supported documents. Understand. So, yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a common. I think that's a uh, that's a common uh, problem that uh, many second line of defense face. They don't feel that they've got a really a place within the organization, and they've got they, they feel empowered enough. I mean, I don't know if if, if you've uh, if you've ever experienced this kind of uh, of comments, but many times um, I wasn't necessarily head of OR, uh, but when I was joining some head of OR functions, um, I was I was having a conversation. One one of the first things I was doing was um, organizing a one to one with the CEO or the MD of the business, and I don't know if you've encountered the same issue, but many times the answer I got was. You know, it's an admin burden. You don't add any value. We don't understand what you're doing. And you know, it is quite mind blowing to hear that from the top management. Um, I don't know if you've been in this situation, whether in your current role or in, in other roles, or you've heard that from the second line, if you are in the first line, but it's, um, it shows how little as well senior management themselves understand the role and the, uh, the, the power, the authority that they need to give to the second line of defense to do a proper job. Can I say something, Jan? Sure. Yeah. Um, in my experience, uh, what I've seen is that, uh, I, I presume uh, uh, last year, there has been a drastic change in the approach from uh, senior management. Now, if you see in quite a few banks, they have introduced one more, uh, I'm, I'm talking of they have introduced one more line of defense, which, which, which rests at the business level. But unfortunately, the business level, I mean, I'm talking of the, well, the teams there are not trained. So um, I'm talking of the first line of defense, they are, the perf they are supposed to identify the risk, right? And if they are not trained, so just imagine the state of affairs. So, and uh, the second drawback is that the second line of defense should have sufficient resources. Yeah, yeah. So if, even if you have to do a sampling of what the, uh, what the business lines are doing, you need to have a separate assurance team. Agreed. Who will have to look into, into, into the uh, reports submitted by the business, business units. So that's another drawback, is what I feel. Mm. I, I, yeah, and, and, I, and I, I, I believe as well the, the what you're describing in terms of sufficient resources might be as a result of not taking OR seriously enough and not giving you know enough credit and enough power to the second line. So I think it's all. It's, yeah, very true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, I, 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 I do, I do feel the same. Uh, and I think many organizations, they put a lot of, you know, a, a lot of resources on credit risk, on market risk, and then oh. compliance has got, has got a lot more resources in the last few years because of all the problems that they've been facing. And then in between all of that, you have operational risk. 
And what I think what management, what firms have, have actually forgotten is that in the end, many events and many failures that occur in credit market or compliance are actually the result of operational risk. Um, true, very true. I mean, we, we, so do, we, do you think we have a second line? Do you think we do a, a good enough job in promoting ourselves, communicating and educating the first line so that we get what we actually deserve and what we need? Yeah, definitely. We have to have, we have to train the first line of defense, no doubt. But the problem is there again, there has to be a concentrated uh, approach in the sense there has to be a clear segregation in terms of money laundering and sanctions. You have to have a team which specializes in money laundering, anti-money laundering, and another team which specializes in anti-terror, I mean, sanctions risk, in identifying sanctions risk. So because yeah. these are two different, actually these are the two pillars of compliance is what I would say. But you need sufficient staff on, in both the teams if you have to train the first line of defense, uh, I, which is I, not happening. I agree. It's, um, I, I see what you mean. And more and more, these risks are becoming more and more sophisticated. I mean, we've seen the emergence of cybercrime. Unless you have somebody with IT security background and understanding of technology, which, you know, I, for instance, I don't have, I'm not a specialist in, in IT security, then that means you can't challenge what the first line is doing and you cannot actually provide the added value that you, you should you know the firm should be expecting from you so again it is unfortunately uh, about resources not not the quantity but also not the quantum of of resources but also the type of resources and it's becoming more and more complicated and more and more specialists are, are, are required yeah i really faced this because i was handling the high net worth segment wherein we had these, uh, I mean, we had PEPs, we had uh, both domestic as well as uh, international PEPs. We, have, we had uh, the wealth management clients, private banking clients. So these are all high net worth clients. So, so I mean, uh, I mean uh, KYC information, we were totally relying on the relationship managers. Yes. And there was no, and whereas the team in the, in the business line was not efficient to provide us, uh, I mean, a comprehensive KYC. Ex and that, that's that's a common a common issue, and um, so I think you know, I've, I've wanted to raise a, a question or a point. No, um, I I also recall somebody one of you mentioned that there was so so there was the, there was the first line of defense uh, implemented, but because not trained, then rely on what they're doing. Actually, let me show you the next slide. And, I, and I've, I've, got a, I've, I've got an example on that, actually, that, uh, you know, a real, a real case that I would like to share with you. So the problem is we've got weaknesses in the first line of defense. I've, I've experienced many times that what the bank do then, or what the firm does, they, they throw more people at checking and testing and doing the doing, you know. Uh, I, I, was, I was working at the large bank and every time there was a failure, they were adding an, 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 ad, an additional level of control or testing. So let's say I've got now, you know, somebody's performing an, an activity and the second day, there's going to be a control to make sure that uh, the first person has done the activity correctly. Let's take the case of, that was the case of KYC CDD. Somebody's reviewing the KYC CDD file and say, yeah, it's good to go. I confirm it's all according to the, uh, the procedures and the KYC CDD standard. Uh, it's a pass. But then they realized that they, they were failures because maybe internal audit came or they had, they had failures, they had events, you know, they were, they were opening accounts to sanctioned parties. So then they looked at the process and instead of actually trying to reinforce and educate and put money and efforts to educate whoever was doing the, the checker, so the, they had the maker checker. What they did is that they, they added a checker. So suddenly we are in a position where we are, a situation where we have a maker and checker and checker. 
And every time, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not joking. This is, a, this is a true live example. Every time there were more failures, they were adding another checker. So at some point you had the maker, checker, 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 checker. And it's like, that means as well, at the end of the day, that you are in the second line, you're looking at the results from the various checker points. They all contradict each other. Um, you can't rely on any of them. They have different methodologies for testing. And in the end, this is all at the first line level. It's not even at the second line. The second line happens afterwards. And then what happens is that suddenly, no one feels responsible at the first line of defense level because it's always going to be somebody else checking. And the person who is checking, the, the first checker is going to say, oh, anyway, somebody else is checking also. So if I make a mistake or if I don't do my job properly, somebody will pick it up. And at the end of the day, you have so many people checking and doing and the checking that you can't even point to, to one, one aspect and say, this is where it's failing. So the responsibility is totally lost. And this is, this is, how, this is how you make you know, a, a, a line of defense, a three line of defense model, total, a total failure, because you can't rely on anything anymore. Uh, I don't know if you've, if you've experienced that, but that, that, that is a real, a real example I, I actually experienced in, uh, in, in a really large bank. Um, and that meant, you know, According to that, and I'm, I'm, I'm not making it up, you know, I've, I've, I've looked at the uh, Baringa, they, they've done a survey between 2019 and 2020. Throughout the presentation or the, the you know, this, this session, you will see I'm putting some quotes from their, from their survey. And their survey is actually interesting because it doesn't cover all the regions of the globe. It focuses on FI, financial institutions. But it does look at most of the respondents who were from North America and Europe. And surprisingly, you look, here is what they, they, they say. There is a 1B team, but they are quite inconsistent. And relationship historically has been really bad, massive friction between the teams. So, you know, between the, there is no trust uh, happening between these people who are checking the first line, which are in the first line as well, and also the second line, because they're not really part of the second line. They have not been trained properly. They have maybe different uh, testing methodology. So actually, you're wasting resources. You're actually wasting resources, the resources of the company. And what I would recommend in this case is to take a step back and actually work out who is doing what and try to rationalize again um, you know, the various level of, of defense and try to explain that. I mean, Another example I will give you, and that, that's, that's very worrying. Um, professionals in, the, in a bank I'm, 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 I was advising recently, I was, uh, I was attending the risk and compliance committee. And believe it or not, the head of compliance was saying in that very meeting, so there's second line, right? Compliance, financial compliance, second line, traditionally. She was saying, she was stating, Actually, I'm not sure if I'm second line. I'm, I might be first line as well. Oh, no, I'm second line. Oh, no, actually, I don't know. She's saying that in front of all the heads of businesses and products. And, and believe me, what do you think these people are going to, are, are going to have as an impression from, from the second line? So if the second line themselves are not clear about what their mandate and their role is, there is no chance the first line is going to get it right. Um, so there's a lot of confusion between responsibilities and especially the second line. Third line is usually very clear. You know, this is internal audit. Big trouble if you, you know, if, if they come and they find something wrong. Um, first line, ongoing monitoring, uh, making sure their controls are operating. They do the risk and control assessment. Um, but the second line sometimes as well, you know, they, they, they're looking for themselves. They, they, they're trying to find where they fit. And it's not always easy, but I think it's key in making yourself respected and be a trusted partner in between the third line and the first line. I don't know how you've, you, you, you've experienced that, but uh, this, is, this is from my experience. I've, I've, I've really uh, encountered these, uh, these many challenges. 
I, uh, I think this, uh, I have another suggestion. I mean, uh, I feel the second line of defense has to work closely with the, with the first line. And uh, in the sense, I, I, I tried this out, in fact, because I moved my office from the head office to the business, your business unit. I took a, a, a cabin there and I started working with them on a daily basis. So then I got a chance of I mean, having uh, trainings at least twice a week, wherein they started discussing cases with me. Mm -hmm. So the, I, was, I was able to really see what issues they are facing in gathering uh, KYC information from the customer because many of them didn't even know how to, you know, they didn't have the, uh, the I mean, they, they didn't have the expertise of how to speak to the customer and secure the information they require. Yeah. So over a period of time, things changed, but uh, it didn't last for long. The reason being the teams grew, whereas our team did not grow. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's challenging. What I sometimes what I find very useful is to have some, um, you know, some key person that actually work as, you know, you work as a, the train, the trainer. I found that very effective. Um, and it doesn't mean that you are cut from everybody in the team. I mean, I used to be at Standard Chartered Bank. I used to have 30, 32 people in my team. And they were located in 21 different countries. So, you know, I had only one person with me at the headquarter here, uh, at the regional headquarter. So that was very challenging. But I was, uh, I was trying to create a core, core team, and not necessarily the head of OR, if there was one, sometimes it was one person per country, but one, one OR, one head of OR, was necessarily the trainer. Or my, my trainer uh, for, for a specific uh, uh, geography. So I had actually identified most of the, the people who were one motivated to do it, and second, who were the best communicator and the best person that are, you know, the best trainers, and, you know, because you need some skills to, be, to train people. And I actually had mandated them and empowered them to say, look, you, you're going to, you're going to you know, deliver the training within this area of, of the geography. So I was in charge of the whole of Africa. There was no way I could train 32 people on a regular basis with people moving, people leaving. It was virtually impossible. Not, to, not also to mention the first line, because then these people can you know, distill the information and educate the first line. So you can't, you can't do it all on your, on, on your own. And but if you've got a, a, a good set of material, uh, you know, the, the foundation material, and you have a solid team of core trainers, then that's much easier. You put less burden on, on very few people. I don't know if you've, if you've approached it this way, but for me, I found it very effective. Let me move to the, um, we've talked about these uh, and, and I think KRIs and MIs is definitely, we will, we will, uh, we will have a look at those um, later on but, you know, in, within, within 15 minutes, but MI, KRI, I will, I, we will get back to that, but it's extremely fundamental to what the second line, uh, how the second line is effective. Uh, I, I, will, I will completely agree there. When we talk about, um, so if I may summarize, um, we've, we've, we've talked about uh, these, these concepts. So it's trusted partnership. I think um, the, the, the last comment that was made was around, you know, we need to be closely working with the first line, definitely. I found one of the last bank I was advising, uh, there's such a lack of trust overall but not only between the first and second line there's such a lack of trust that actually issues are not being raised so what happens is that when issues are becoming visible it's actually too late down the line and there's quite a lot of remediation to be made um, and i found that very very damaging for 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 the organization uh, so a trusted partnership is absolutely key um, the second thing I find very important is uh, the, are the systems and tools. Most of the time, I don't, I don't, I don't know how, and, and it works with terminologies and jargon as well. 
I mean, it's, it's about keeping it simple. Uh, again, a, a few, a, a year and a half ago, I was working for, uh, for a bank and I was reading their supporting material, you know, their, the operation risk policy, the operation risk manual, um, the operation risk uh, taxonomy and universe. Do they have a risk? Li they didn't have a risk library. Well, they have a risk library, but not a control library. Actually, you know what? Only 46% of, uh, according to the same survey, uh, Baringa, only about half of the population said they have a standardized risk and control library in place, which meant that people didn't express or raise the risks properly, or they didn't, they didn't have a standardized way to uh, assess what controls and, and frame and name the controls. So for the second line, it becomes very, very uh, messy and, and very difficult to find their way through and quickly identify, okay, and, and, and also aggregate. You know, if you've got a, a risk could cut across many different departments. So let's say sanctions risk, it could be in HR where you hire people. It could be with your vendors. You might, you might hire vendors or third parties that are actually sanctioned parties. Mm -hmm. Hello? I think someone wanted to make a comment. Yeah, so how, you know, systems and tools, you need to illustrate. I found a lot of, uh, so, so this bank had a very, very complicated jargon. I mean, they had come up with compensating different type of control, compensating controls and correcting controls. And I, I understand detective and preventive or preventative as you like it, but they had come up with, I don't know, five or six different types of controls. When I was looking, when, when another bank, they came up with a control library and in there, there was policy, which was a control. And I'm like, I don't think a document is a control. A document could support a control, it's a control attribute. But it's not a control itself. It's not because you have a piece of document that you're going to reduce the risk. Uh, it's a factor. It's a part of the control environment, but it's not a control. Um, training. Training is an interesting one. You know, is training a control? It might reduce risk, but not in a systematic way. So I think for the second line, to be extremely clear in the definitions, provide simple tools for the first line to operate and illustrate it uh, you know, many times. Uh, you know, again, recently, there is this template. Okay, and then give the template to three different people. I guarantee you, and, and there was, you know, this was the result. The three different people came back with a completely different way to fill in the, the, the template. So I said, well, let's work on, a, on a, what good looks like. What do we expect people to put in this document? You know, do we need a 15 page long or three page long is enough? So you try through illustration examples, you actually educate. So I think you need to educate both on the theory, but so much more on the practice. Um, what we did recently in a, in a, in a, in a bank, it was actually no bank, is do some risky, risk cafes. So it's very informal, it's educational, but it's, it's focusing, like these webinars, it's focusing on a specific topic. Let's talk about that. And people can freely express their concerns or what they're not happy with or the difficulties they have in applying the, the framework, the operational risk framework and methodology that they've been given. Um, so that's, that's, that's really what it is. And, and so that's why in many different times, uh, many different times, what I have seen is that the first line adopts the methodology. They apply the methodology, but it's a ticket the box exercise it's because they have to do it. You know, they, we have to do an RCSA, risk and control self-assessment. Oh, it's this time of the year we will have to refresh it. My last time I, I, I had a call recently with, um, with the head of IT. I said, I don't want you to do it for me. I don't want, I want you to do it for yourself because it's useful for you. I want you to know what key controls you have in your department. And I want you to take this control library with the monitors and tell me which, where you have deficiencies 
and where you need support to remediate these deficiencies. And that's what I'm expecting to see at, your, at the risk and compliance committee. Risk and, yeah, the risk and compliance committee. Um, so this is about the usefulness. It's not, it's not, it's not for, for second line that they're doing it. It's for themselves. It's for their responsibility as first line owner, business owner, and ultimately they own the risk. They own the risk and they operate the controls. So, you know, sometimes as well, the terminology is very, um, can be confusing. You know, we talk about risk owners. Sometimes we, as second line, we're not helping our, our case. I don't know if you, if you would agree there. We already called risk management, or that means that's where manage, risk are managed, and it's nothing to do with the first line. Um, but that's, a, that's probably a bigger debate. Yeah, so. you, you are very right in what you said that it's actually the uh, first line uh, does the RCSA only because the second line requires it to do so, but not for their own benefit. Exactly. That is, that is a problem, yeah. That is a problem. And I, I, I think it's, uh, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe signing the templates with them would help because then they can see it's not something that they do as a side alone document, but it's something that is embedded with what they're doing. So a, a technique and, and, and one tip that I found useful, that I'm gonna share with you is um, the process maps. I don't know how many of you um, use process maps to review risk and control self-assessment for. I, I, I mean, personally, I can't do it on a procedure document which is 50 pages long. No way. Um, I can do it on a process map. Oh, yeah, we, we use RCMs. Which is, which is, which is good. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's really looking at what the first line is using and try to actually adapt the tools that we are developing so that it's, it forms one and only uh, deliverable that is useful for everybody but specifically for them. So maybe there are some, some uh, you know, they may, may, maybe this is, this is something to explore uh, more. And, and because most of the time, and, and no offense to the, uh, you know, all the consultants that can come and help you put the framework together, but most of the time, what these people do that they come and it's a copy paste from something new, something separate, something similar that they've done somewhere else and, and they all look the same. But maybe we need to step back and think, what would the business be using? How do we make it user friendly? So putting the stakeholders back into the center, like you know, most banks say they're customer centric. Well, think about the customer. So maybe as a second line, we need to think with a first line mindset, uh, and maybe maybe design the tools uh, in in conjunction or, or jointly with the first line. Some thoughts. Um, the right frequency. I think you've seen it. Um, I don't know how often you're doing your your, uh, your the business is, is is conducting risk and control self assessment or however you call it uh, in your own jargon. But you've seen even in the Western world, uh, most of them are done only once a year. Yeah, they refreshed. Uh, actually, yeah, it's more than that. But they refreshed not more than once uh, once annually, which means that they're not living documents, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, excuse me, uh, Samer has a question. Uh, can you allow him? Of course. Samer, please go ahead. Simon, you might be on mute. Samir? Samir? I think you might be on mute. Okay. Let's go ahead, Aaron. Let's go ahead. Not a problem. Happy to take questions anytime. Uh, we've talked about that. So key success factors. I think if you, um, if you establish a strong first line, first comment that came up was a lack of, of monitors MI. 
Definitely. I mean, if you, if the first line has not established controls, they haven't done their RCSA, you haven't got any metrics or any kind of tools or, or monitoring um, information that you can actually assess, challenge, what, what is it that we can do as a, as a second line? Very, very difficult job. Um, so once, once you've, to, to establish a strong and effective second line, you need an effective and strong first line. That's the really foundation. Uh, I think we've, we've talked about KRIs and KCIs and MI. This, I could, I could have like a whole training day on this topic because there's so much to say about it. Uh, but I think it's it, even in, in very advanced and mature organization, believe me, um, you, you would have very, very, very big surprises uh, and, and, and not nice ones. Uh, I, I recently, I was, I was talking to, um, again recently, I was talking to um, uh, the head of IT, uh, IT security actually. And, and, the per, and, and I said, look, I need to understand what controls, what key controls you have and you monitor. And there was a silence on the other side of the line. And he said, well, would you, how many controls do you want? And I'm like, what do you mean? How many controls do you have? And, and the person said, well, I've got hundreds of controls. No, thousands of controls. I'm like, right, okay. Um, so I was thinking to myself, this is not a good start. So I was trying to you know, push him, push him, push him to get me the top 10. I said, I need only the key controls. And it was, the conversation lasted about half an hour to get to the point where I said, look, you're on a deserted island. You need to manage your risks, IT, cybercrime risk. You're allowed only 10. Which ones do you take? Which one do you take with you that you can't, you can't sleep at night if you haven't got this top 10? Go, go, think about it, come back in a week. Um, so it's, it's, it's challenging, but you, people on the first line need to take a step back and think really, what are my most important controls? Because as a second line, we cannot test thousands of controls. I mean, I doubt they have thousands of controls. If they have thousands of controls, I'm really worried. But also, even if they had to have thousands of controls, there is no way we can test and monitor and review and report thousands of controls. So I think we should, we should not be afraid to push back on these kind of statements. Um, adequate escalation and remediation actions, obviously. Um, and we've talked about the, the other one, second line of defense. Uh, useful comments here, so many metrics, useful for management, but not consumable by the board. I agree to, to some extent with this statement. I think we are, and more and more, with, the, with an, an overwhelming amount of data, and not all data is management information. You know, it's, it, data is raw by definition. Management information is something that has been analyzed, is data which has been analyzed, and is telling you something. Um, so it's something that you can say, yes, should I be worried? Do I need to do something? Is there escalation needed? Etc. If remediation needed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is where data becomes management information. Um, you'll have this on YouTube. Um, and conscious of time, we've got 15 minutes to go. So I will. Uh, you will see that actually, MI uh, is featuring very, very strongly in this uh, in this survey. And you know whether you you have forward-looking as well as backward-looking. A lot of the MI is still backward-looking. That means you're not managing your risk in a proactive way, unfortunately. And in my again here, evidence of control operators. We've talked about it earlier. Uh, it was the first comment raised. Key control indicators available. Actually, 60% shows that financial should have gaps in this area. You know, more than 50%, which is, which is actually quite... Uh, quite worrying. I'll get to the second poll. I'm going to pause. We're going to pause here. I'm going to, um, I've got a second question for you. And I would like to know whether you have an annual assurance testing plan that you have prepared, that has been approved, and that the second line of defense team is executing. 
So Malavan is going to run the poll and we're going to see the results. So, so far, eight people have answered. We're waiting for a few more answers. Don't be shy. Okay, I think we are probably there or thereabout. Right. So, about, about a, yeah, between a quarter and a third of you have got less than 30% have an assurance testing plan which has been prepared, approved, and then the second line of defense team is executing. Out of those who have said no, what is the, the aspect that is, 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 uh, you feel is, a, is improving? Is it that you don't have a testing plan at all? Or, um, or is it that it has not been approved? Or it's not being executed because you are in a firefighting mode, which is unfortunately where a lot of the second line of defense teams usually find themselves. What is your, what is your, what is your view? I think it is more or less left on the expertise of the second line of defense to design their own testing mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, but the management has not set forth any particular plan on how they will go about it. Okay. Okay. So, May I ask a question? When you, when, if you do quality assurance testing, are you doing it, I mean, do, do you on the fly or every month do you say, okay, I'm going to test that because actually we've got a deficiency, so I'm going to test this? Or is it that you prepare a plan in advance based on certain considerations, criteria, and then you deploy this plan yourself or is it really ad hoc and you're going to say oh this week i'm going to test this and this and this because at the committee this problem was raised therefore i need to go and rush to a testing here there's a bit of fire what what's what's the situation that the second are you a second line uh are finding yourselves can i say something here Yes, sure, sure. Yeah. And what I have what I have experienced is that this this point which you raise comes up only when the audit department comes to the comes to the second line of defense. When they come and audit us, that is when all these things come up. And even though they do it, they take a very long time. So it's it's like you know, these uh, the like the, the cases which we present as as high, high risk, by the time they complete their review. I mean, the customer's out of the bank. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it becomes, a, it becomes a, a stale issue by the time they complete their review. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, that, as you that, said, the second line of defense has to have a, more authority. Yeah, my colleague it's, here has said it. Their reports. Okay, yes. More authority, more resources, it goes back to the, to the, to the same. Same, same challenges that we discussed before. Um, are there are there any? I mean, on, on um, you know, when I was looking at assurance uh, testing and the assurance work stream uh, back at Standard Chartered Bank, uh, it was a major remediation program, and we were looking at defining a plan for the year. So similarly to the third line of defense, the second line of defense had actually highlighted really high risk areas where they wanted to focus and make sure that controls were operating. And I agree, you need to reach a certain maturity level from the second line to be able to do a minimum of testing because you're not gonna go and test weak controls. You know they're weak. So what's the point of testing weak controls, right? Uh, you're only gonna confirm what you already know. So what you want to do is Possibly where you, with, the, with the data that you have at your disposal is actually where, uh, for instance, you have high risk, very high risk, 
for which the bank has very low tolerance, then if you've got that gap, so think about it, you've got a high inherent risk, let's say sanctions, yeah, international sanctions. You know that your risk tolerance or your risk appetite is very low. So you have, you need to have a number of controls in place to reduce the risk. So what I found quite useful as an approach, and this might be ad hoc, but it, could, it, could, it can help you create some form of a plan. Um, what I was looking at is uh, all, these, you know, all these risks where you have a high difference between the inherent risk level and the residual risk level. So let's say, yeah, my compliance function or my first line is telling me, yeah, all the controls on transaction screening, they're perfect. It's running like, you know, perfectly. We captured, we all, we all have the, um, the matches, we review all the, uh, all the screening, the positive match, and we escalate to compliance for the second line review, et cetera. Okay, fine. They are, they are claiming, yep, yeah, residual risk is green. We are within appetite, no problem. That's actually one control you want to go and test. Not necessarily those that are weak, but those that are reducing the risk level so much that they are being declared as low residual risk. So this is because this is where you have your most vulnerable. If these controls fail, suddenly your risk is no longer at low level, your control fails, your residual risk goes up to high. So if you have areas, I mean, what I, what I find useful is that to, to identify these risks where you have a high inherent risk level and a, and a low residual risk, which is being declared by the first line as low. And that's where I want to go and test. Uh, because if these fail, then big trouble. Uh, and you want to define, you identify the weaknesses before the third line comes or before you have a major risk event and the regulator comes and say, you've got weak screening controls, uh, we're, gonna put, we're gonna find you for that. Uh, so that's, that's a technique, it's not a proper structured plan, but it can help build something proactive that the second line can execute, can define and execute, which is adding value and which will take you away from just doing the firefighting and whatever is being requested by the third line or the management. I don't know if you've got something like that in place or, and what you think about that idea, would that work in your, in your, in your band? Yes, it's a very valid uh, point. And uh, yeah, it, it will certainly help in developing a, uh, an appropriate plan. Okay, any other thoughts? I guess what I'm trying to also uh, express here is that the second line, operational second line, is not considered only as, oh, there is a fire here, firefighters come here, or you, know, you help, or you do an investigation, you do a root cause analysis to find what went wrong, but we are being seen as adding value because then that creates a virtuous circle by which we, we prove we add value and therefore management say, oh, okay, actually they've identified an issue proactively and maybe they've avoided us, you know, a major concern or major trouble. And I think it's, it helps with us establishing our respect, a trust with the first line, respect by management, um, and therefore building a reputation internally and increasingly being able to be seen as a real partner, one, but also as a real challenger and um, being able then to get more resources for what we're doing. Because that's really, you know, resources is always a very, very big issue for a second line. And, and too often we are running around trying to cater for all type of issues that are emerging or that are sprouting here and there, when really, if, if everything was going as you know, designed, as perfectly designed, we would be in a proactive mode and preventing these issues from happening. 
So sometimes it's difficult to generate this virtual circle, but once you've started, it's actually quite, quite beneficial for, for all parties and definitely for operational risk. As, um, has anyone got any, 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 other, any other thoughts around that or any, any success factors? I'm, I'm, you know, I've got here a few, a few key takeaways. Uh, I talk about understanding your vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, what are the, where are you high risk versus low residual, high inherent, um, so that you can apply a risk-based approach. Risk-based approach in terms of controls. Uh, not testing the processes steps, but really test the key controls. Um, also having a look at the assurance coverage map. I mean, we can, we can have a really, really deep dive session on, on, on assurance. But what I had done for Standard Chartered Bank back in the, um, in the assurance work stream was to define at all levels of defense who was doing what kind of testing and how often. And I had realized that there were, there were areas where everybody was doing massive amount of testing. And there were themes or areas where no one was doing any testing. No one. Absolutely, it was not touched at all, not even on a yearly basis. But if you were looking even at two years or three years, it hadn't been touched at all. So that actually shows, that actually can be also a good starting point. Trying to find out, establish that map, and see where do we have gaps. And in these gaps, do we have high risks? And are we relying a lot on controls? Because that might be an area that you want to put on your plan to test. Um, any thoughts about, about, about that? I mean, how do you have, you, have you ever come across, you know, developing such coverage maps and how effective was it in your in your um, in your firm yeah we've tried to um, build the uh, coverage maps based on uh, uh, the categories of risks uh, whether high risk medium risk or low risk so that uh, we can focus more on the testing on the high risk areas Okay. Uh, and uh, avoid uh, utilizing resources for uh, low risk areas. So, yeah. so to test it more efficiently. That's right. That's right. And, and, and actually, you can, that is a very powerful element to support the plan that you're defining. Because then, you know, if you present that typically at the risk and control, risk and compliance committee or the board risk committee, um, then you can really support the rationale for why are you testing here and not there um, where is the uh, where is the business not mature enough because then there is no point testing what is not in place yet um, don't forget as well that sometimes some key aspects of a control environment could also be tested by external parties sometimes you would, you, would, you would have external audits uh, also being mandated on very specific area. I'm thinking about IT cyber security. Sometimes you can mandate an external firm to do uh, a certification or a validation of your control environment, of your controls. Uh, that's actually quite good because you don't need necessarily to have some specialist knowledge in your team, but, um, but you actually rely, you can actually do it through um, a specialist firm that you pay for. Uh, and, and, and that's much, much better for uh, utilizing your resources and not spending a huge amount of money on somebody that you're going to have permanently in your team. So that's another way to, to do it. Um, I think again, um, we could also look at these in more details, but um, maybe in a different session, we can do a deep dive on that. Uh, the many ways you can do the testing um, I would highlight, key, I have highlighted key controls. Um, many times as well, I'm, I'm surprised about how little business restrictions, which are actually the first mitigants, like risk avoidance, are actually not tested at all. Everybody takes for granted that, you know, a product is not sold, 
uh, you know, management or the board has said, we have no appetite to do this. And actually you discover that the business is still, is still selling the product. Um, I've got a good example to just briefly, and, and that would be probably uh, um, uh, one last comment I made before, before the last uh, questions from, from you. But um, I was working for Excel Insurance, a big, big internet, Excel Captain, big insurance company. And they were, the, 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 the manual, the underwriting policy is clear, you know, casualty and property business, nothing else. And then we discovered, we received $30 million on our bank account one day, and we were looking at what the hell is this? And everybody was running around like chicken saying, what, what is this money coming from? And we discovered that our rep bureau in San Francisco had actually underwrite, underwritten an insurance policy for space shuttles. That was not in the policy. That was not in the risk appetite of the insurance company. Well, because no one verified that, no one told them they couldn't do it. Um, and therefore, when well, they're not supposed to ignore the policy, but no one actually tested that they hadn't done so. And um, good example in AML CDD, maybe some lines of business or some segments are a no-go or jurisdictions are a no-go or products are a no-go or type of customers are a no-go. How do you make sure that these business restrictions are actually applied. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised and you know, that's, that's probably the strongest and, and the most important mitigation that the bank can have in place. Um, I'm gonna close on that note. Have you got any more questions? Because I think we, we, are, we are running into, into three o'clock or two o'clock your time. Um, is there any, any um, yeah. final remarks or comments or questions? And I have something to say. I think uh, this the last point which you raised on uh, the testing. I mean, there sh uh, in fact, what I had done in my bank was I had prepared an internal policy wherein I had clearly defined the responsibilities of the three lines of defense. So in, in, uh, along with that, I incorporated this testing as well. As to, and I, in fact, I insisted on periodic testing and gave them the, the time frame according to their convenience and I also gave them an escalation matrix so that they could appoint staff accordingly and, and uh, conduct, conduct the testing. So that really worked. That really works. Okay. Yeah, that really good. worked. In fact, even the compliance committee appreciated me for that. Mm. Yes. So that's not like a standalone, it's in, incorporated in their yeah. own yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. So in, internally, so internally, institutions should have their own policies and procedures. Apart from the, uh, I mean, main uh, main policies are related to AML and sanctions. They should have internal policies as well. Otherwise, they can have service level agreements. If the business is not ready to cooperate, they can have service level agreements. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit firmer and stronger, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depends on the culture and the environment in your in your. Yeah, in your... yeah. It, it depends. It depends upon how, uh, as you said, how the three lines of defense are, and how authoritative senior management is. <laughs> but yeah, that's so. That's a good solution as well. Really good, really good tip here. Any other any comment or question? Hello, Anne. Yes. Uh, hi, I think we should have told them uh, at the beginning of the session that if they are not participating or asking questions, then we have to send out invoices to them. <laughs> uh, please feel free to ask questions. And uh, feel free to ask questions outside after, after the, the, the session. Absolutely no problem. Uh, I'd be really happy to. Uh, yeah, and just, I think I have a question. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just linking this question to the current scenario. What are your views on uh, the challenges the operations risk departments uh, are facing during this pandemic? Uh, I think they've, they've been pulled into so many directions. Uh, they've, been, they've been really firefighting with, you know, depends if they are BCP. I mean, they've been running with BCP, then they've been running with uh, staff issues because between people who are sick 
people who want to go back home, people who are stranded out, uh, you know, abroad. It creates all issues, not, not to mention the ability to be working remotely. So I think the, the second line of defense has been really struggling and stretched even more than, than, than normal because they suddenly had to cater for, you know, in emergency, set up many, many elements to be able to continue business as much as possible as usual. Um, I, I, I think the resource issues have really come out as very, very obvious uh, in, this, in this way. Uh, and I think a lot of other things have taken, have taken a step back, actually. They've, they've taken a, you know, yeah, a, a step back. Um, but, uh, but I think maybe, maybe, depending on how efficient and how value add the second line had and operations had in managing the, 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 you know, the challenges during this crisis, uh, maybe they've shown, they've been able actually to show how value, what value they bring. So maybe it's not all that bad. Um, so think about it and think about how can you make your, your function, Operation Second Line, value as a value partner during this crisis? Do you feel that you have actually increased your, your impact and your value? And you actually feel that people um, especially first line and senior management see you with a different eye now. Okay. Would, would you say that uh, the role of the second line of defense is undermined because of the, of the, of the currents in this situation? Uh, I would say a, a, a lot of the recurring activities might have taken a step back, but I think it's an opportunity as well to, for us, for, for us professional at the second line of defense, to show what value we can bring you know, by staying calm and be very, you know, be, be, be very uh, um, process oriented and methodological in how we apply and deploy our own methodology. So we are actually the best advocate and we, we are the best advocate for following our own framework, if, I see, if you see what I mean. So I think partnering with the first line and partnering with management as well is a way for us to show what we are good at, what we can actually deliver as value. So you, you, could, you can see it, yes, it's challenging, but actually in any challenge, you can shine as well. You can, you can make yourself and what you're bringing uh, as, as, as an added value. And I think that's, that's the opportunities. It's through challenging time that you actually see you know, who, who is shining and who is making a difference and who is bringing people up um, you know, who is partnering with, with HR when it comes to people being stranded at home and the, the HR policy is being amended, whether it's reduction in salary, whether it's remote working, uh, working with IT to, you know, to facilitate um, this uh, remote working without opening up some cyber security issues, for instance. So it's all about that. It's, 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 it's very much, um, it's very much a partnering and everybody's is impacted. So I think this is, this is one, of the, one of the type of event where you can bring people together and really make a difference, see, you know, show that you can make a difference. Yeah, good point. It's, it's really very challenging. And <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, and if there are any more questions, um, this is the last slide, of, um, so you've got our contact details, feel free to uh, reach out to us, Malavan or, or myself, I'll be happy to, you know, I'm available on Skype as well if you want to have a short conversation, um, drop me an email uh, or a message on WhatsApp, whatever means of communication you feel more at ease to, to use. Uh, and I'll be, I'll be very, very happy to host, uh, you know, the next session with Serendip Training and Malavan. Uh, Malavan is very helpful in, um, in uh, you know, allowing for this session to happen. is wonderful. So I'll be really happy to partner with, uh, with Malavan again and uh, have, a, have a let's talk session again on operational risk. <laughs>